Well, good morning and welcome to Discovery's Digital Worship Gathering. My name is Kay and I'm one of Discovery's summer interns. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab it. Uh, we're going to be beginning uh, this morning with uh, Psalm 26. Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love, and I have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. The Word of the Lord. Good morning, Discovery. We are so excited to worship with you guys today. Wherever you're at, whether you're still in bed, you're on your couch, or maybe you are at the store or driving home or something in your car, uh, we just invite you guys to worship with us today and just kind of uh, take a moment to focus on the Lord and spend some time with Him. So whatever you got on your heart, whatever is bothering you today, let's just leave that at the foot of the cross and uh, leave it in the hands of the one who's fighting for us today. It's about of the shadows, it's about of the grave. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Cause run into our open spaces, graces waiting for you. Dance like the way has been lifted. Cause graces waiting where the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom, there is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom It's a matter of the dark, just as you are Into the fullness of His love I won't forget. 
forget the wonder of how you grow Deliverance, the exodus of my heart You found me, you freed me Held back the waters for my release Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord of Hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A cloud by day, a sign that you are with me. A fire by night, a guide in And thank you, worship team, and thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us this morning. I want to especially welcome any of you who may be new to Discovery or just checking us out. Glad to have you. Um, if you're new here, we want to encourage you to fill out a connections card, and you can find this card by downloading our app. In two simple steps, you'll be well on your way into getting involved and staying in the loop. Um, and speaking of being in the loop, I have a couple of quick announcements for us. Discovery's women's team is, host, uh, is hosting a socially distanced park hangout tomorrow night at 6.30, so email Carrie for more information. Our updated website launched this week, so if you haven't had a chance to check that out, go ahead and take a look. Finally, we are excited to continue partnering with Montgomery Elementary in South Davis to serve students, 
teachers and families with back to school supplies. Even though it's gonna be a start, a weird start for this year, they're still excited to help, uh, have us help them with backpacks and other items. You can find the list on our webpage and then bring the backpacks and supplies to the downtown center starting this week through August 23rd. And now for our offering. As a community, we aim to give worshipfully, missionally, and sacrificially. And that doesn't change even as we gather in this way. You can give through our app or webpage or send a check to our downtown center. Thank you for partnering with us and help people to discover the good news of Jesus. Let me pray for this offering. Father, we thank you uh, for this offering. Thank you so much, Lord, that you provide the way. God, we thank you so much for providing every blessing that we receive from you. And God, with this offering that we give, may, may it be used for your kingdom, to glorify your kingdom, and have your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray um, yeah, that people would discover the good news of Jesus through this offering. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome again to our digital gathering here at Discovery Christian Church, getting together online. My name is Steve, and I'm the lead pastor for this community that we call Discovery. As Kay said a few moments ago, I do want to say a special uh, welcome uh, invitation to those of you who may be new, checking us out for the first time, especially here online. We would love uh, to hear from you, whether that's through the connection card or even just you know send me an email, uh, send one of our staff an email. We would love to get to know you a little bit better and hopefully help answer any questions you have about uh, who we are and what we're doing, particularly during this uh, time that we are in together. Uh, before we get into Scripture, and we are going to spend some time this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 24, continuing in the life of David. Before we get to that, just a couple quick things. It was so great to have James and Megan lead worship for us again today, all the way from Providence, Rhode Island. We are now less than two months away from them joining us, moving across the country to be a part of our team. The countdown is on, so please continue to be in prayer for that transition, and we'll let you know about some ways to help welcome them here uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, you also heard, uh, again, about the backpack drive, and I'll be honest, when um, we got word that school this year was going to be starting remotely, I thought, well, we're probably not going to be doing the backpack drive again, what are some other things that, that we can do? Our street team has been coordinating and, and working on some of those details. And while there may be a lot of other ways for us to serve families, and we will uh, be working on letting you know what those ways might be, the backpack uh, and school supply drive is very much on. The school is very excited to have us uh, do that. Uh, Montgomery Elementary serves a, a lot of students that need these sorts of resources, especially Given that we are starting remotely, it's going to be so helpful to these families to get these supplies to be able to start off the school year strong, even remotely having to do it from home the way that we all are. So here's the thing. This is my uh, specific challenge for us as a community. This is now the third time uh, that we're doing this drive since I've been here. And the last two years, we've hit like 48 or 49 backpacks. And I would love for us to be able to blast right past that into the 50s this year. Okay, so that's my challenge for you, Discovery. 50 plus backpacks full of school supplies for these families that are going to have to be figuring out how to do uh, school remotely this fall. All right, that's my challenge to you. Let's now uh, dig into our text for this morning. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 24, and I want to begin by reading for us a couple of verses from the end of the chapter. So we're going to begin at verse 16 and go through the end, and then I'll pray, and then we'll talk about this a little bit, all right? So 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 16, when David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he, Saul, wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. 
When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now, swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. And so David gave his oath to Saul, and Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the strongholds. Let's pray. Father, we begin this morning um, with a a word uh, of prayer for families here in Davis, around our county, and around our country who are facing the prospect of starting school remotely and trying to figure out schedules and how to do this from home, um, how to start a school year in this way. We just finished one, but how do you start a school year uh, like this? God, we pray for uh, administrators, teachers, families, kids, Uh, all the different people impacted by this, God. It is going to be a challenge, and we need your help. And God, I pray for our church that in a small way you would use us to be a blessing to uh, families in our community during this time. Um, May we be generous towards them. May you use these school supplies again. It might seem like not a huge thing, God, but would you use it and multiply it to extend your love and grace uh, to those that really need it during this time. Now, Father, as we turn our attention to Scripture, to your Word, would you speak to us? Would you use this story to form us and shape us? There is a lot here in this interaction that speaks to us in this moment that we are in so clearly. And so would you remove the barriers, the distractions, whatever that might be for us today, God, so that we can be fully present here in this moment, so that we can hear your voice speaking to us challenging us, graciously inviting us deeper into right relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. I think I was about 13 or 14 years old when I read The Count of Monte Cristo. Any of you read this book or even seen the movie? If you're familiar with the story, you know that it's one of literature's great tales of revenge. This uh, this story that I think really spoke to me as a early teenager, a nerdy teenager. There's something about that that speaks to you in all kinds of sinister ways. <laughs> Human beings love revenge, and, and I think there's a tension inherent in this desire for revenge. On the one side, it, it, I think it's a recognition of the ways that God intended the world to function and flourish. That state of right relationships that the writers of Scripture call shalom. We live in a world where where we have this very real present recognition that shalom, the way things ought to be, has been vandalized, destroyed, ruined in some way. It continues to be vandalized. This is what theologians call sin. And so there's this part of us that has this deep desire for justice and righteousness And that is a good thing, but that longing improperly channeled leads us to this desire for revenge. And we see this all over our culture, all over pop culture. Movies, television shows, songs, uh, social media is, is, is saturated with revenge stories. Revenge stories that momentarily satiate that deeply ingrained God given desire for justice. Eugene Peterson writes, there are many things that we must not do. Many things that we must not do, cannot do, if we are to be faithful to Jesus. Violence is high on the list. Taking things into our own hands, getting rid of the offender along with the offense. As we continue this journey uh, with David, remember David is in this wilderness period. He's on the run. He's hiding out. This is a dangerous time for him as he's trying to stay alive. Saul, the current king of Israel, is hunting him down, wanting to kill him and take his life. And in our story today, David is going to have 
a golden opportunity for revenge. And I want us to pay very careful attention to how David handles this opportunity. So the story begins like this. We're going to dial back to verse 1 and then kind of work our way back up towards that text we read just a moment ago. The story begins, Saul is off fighting the Philistines, which is what he's supposed to be doing. This is part of his uh, duty as king of Israel, off fighting the Philistines. But then he decides it's time to get back to hunting down David, which is not what he's supposed to be doing. This is a distraction from his tasks as king. He hears... Saul hears that David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And so he takes 3,000 men with him to look for David near, and this is a direct quote from verse 2, near the crags of the wild goats. <laughs> Isn't scripture great? Just these details that are there in this story. David is hanging out near the crags of the wild goats. And so Saul takes 3,000 men with him to go find him. David, if you remember has uh, uh, originally 400, and then the number grows to about 600 discontent, indebted, distressed men with him. So 3,000 is a bit much, Saul, to be taken with you to find David. I think it speaks again a lot to who Saul is. So Saul is out with his 3,000 men, the crags of the wild goats, searching for David, and he has to, as we say in our house, take a potty break. Or as the NIV says, Saul needed to relieve himself. And so he goes into a cave to take care of his business. And it just so happens that this is the cave that David and some of his men are hiding out in. What an incredible coincidence. David's men immediately go, aha, look at this wonderful opportunity. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with. As you wish. Now, David doesn't strike Saul down here, at least not immediately, but he does mess with him a little bit. He sneaks up, as Saul's relieving himself, he sneaks up on Saul, cuts off a corner of his robe, and I just, I love that. It's so awesome. It's this like uh, Ethan Hunt, Mission Impossible kind of thing to do, but it is also not an arbitrary random thing at all. This is a deeply symbolic gesture. The robe represented the kingdom. Earlier in the story of David, we see Jonathan, Saul's son, give David his robe as this symbolic move, saying, hey, I recognize that you are going to be the next king of Israel. Take my robe. The robe is a symbol of the kingdom. And so David doesn't kill Saul in the moment, but this is a move. This is aggression towards Saul as the king. And immediately afterwards, David is conscience stricken. He feels terrible for doing this sneaky thing to Saul. And so David rebukes his men and then runs out of the cave and confronts Saul. And he uses the robe as this tangible demonstration of his gracious sparing of Saul's life. Now, I want us to pause here for just a moment and break this down a little bit further because this story gives us an incredible picture of David's character. Three pictures, really, of his character. First, we get a picture, an insight into David's discernment process. David's men have a particular interpretation of these events. Oh my goodness, Saul's in our cave relieving himself. This is exactly what God said was going to happen. He's delivered your enemies into your hands. It's totally obvious what needs to happen here. And part of what's tricky about what the men do is they directly quote God's words back to David. And yet, and yet David doesn't see it exactly the same way. And this is so important for us to pay attention to. Just because someone is, is quoting a verse to us or quoting something God said, that doesn't make it an endorsement. We can uh, slap a Bible verse on a lot of things. We can label a lot of stuff Christian and yet be very,
very far removed from what God would want us to do in a particular situation. Are you with me? Now, there are numerous examples of this that we could point to. I'll just repeat one that we've mentioned before. When someone quotes a a, a portion of scripture to you, posts a, a verse on Facebook or whatever, and says, see, this is why this pandemic is happening. My pastoral word of caution to you is be very wary of that. Be very wary of that. People have always used God's words to deceive and manipulate. And maybe no more so than now in our digital age where there's so much fake stuff on the internet. We can slap a Bible verse, we can label something as being Christian, and it can be very far removed from God's intentions for us in that moment. Now, having said that, I do feel for David and his men. Because they're not falling for some internet meme or trick here. In all honesty, I I think I would probably be right there with David's men. Because again, it's so clear. Saul's right there uh, taking a leak in this cave. How much more obvious does it need to be? And yet for David, for David, something is off. David's interpretation of these events is so different from his men. David is in line with God's heart. And with the trajectory of God's story, again, an example of David's holy imagination, his story-formed heart, which God's story always moving towards what? Progressing towards what? Redemption, restoration, reconciliation. David has internalized the trajectory of God's story. From Genesis chapter 4 on, Cain and Abel on, human beings have been trying to solve problems through violence. But God restores his creation through relationships, through sacrifice, leading towards redemption and reconciliation and restoration. We also get a picture here of David's heart, David's heart alignment, or maybe a better word is David's heart realignment. David is trending towards revenge early on here. But then he has this conscience-stricken moment, and then he's obedient to this prompting. Now, the conscience is not something that we talk a lot about in church or even in our, our broader culture anymore. I wonder if we do well to speak more about it, though especially in our impulse-driven digital world where it's just so easy, right? That quick itch to dash off a comment, send a text, post something that we know is just going to zing that person that we are frustrated with. The question for us is this, do we even give our conscience the time and the space to stricken us, if you will? When James The brother of Jesus in the New Testament says that we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Part of what he is saying there is that if all we do is talk, there's no room, there's no space, there's no quiet to be able to hear what God might be saying to us. Maybe our conscience actually has been talking to us, been pinging us this whole time, but there's just too much noise for us to notice. And then, then there's the issue where we do hear what our conscience is saying, but we're like, nah, I'm good. (laughs) And we just ignore it and move on. And here's the other part of this. We can always find someone who will agree with us. How easy would it have been for David to say, guys, I think my conscience is is saying that I should let Saul go uh, for several of these men to be like, no, no, no. That's, that can, it can't be saying that. That's wrong. Can you imagine David with a smartphone in that cave? He's live streaming this thing. You know, look guys, Saul's in the cave with me. Should I kill him? Yes or no? One of those polls, right? And all of his men are just like pounding the like kill him button, right? Like that's how we work today. Not only is David sensitive enough to hear what his conscience is saying, he's also courageous enough to be obedient 
to the prompting, even though all the people around him are like, this is it, man. This is your golden opportunity. Let me say that again. Not only is David sensitive enough to hear what his conscience is saying, he's also courageous enough to obey this prompting. Now, one more thing about all of this that I think is, is important. David and Saul have this moment at the end of the chapter. We read that just a few moments ago. But Saul will, as he has done so many times, go back on his word and he will start to pursue David again. And of course, the, the way the story ends, you know, spoiler alert here, but just bear with me. The way the story ends is God does remove Saul uh, from the kingship and David will take over. And what I'm trying to say here is, is this, the ends don't justify the means. Sometimes we think we, you know, we obey because it's going to make a nice, happy ending to the story, but we are far too pragmatic at times. The more important thing here is that David listens and obeys this prompting. That's more important than whether or not it leads to a good outcome. In our pragmatism, we're willing to obey only if it produces a good result, only if the story has a happy ending. But God is far less interested in the result. He's in control of it all anyway. God is far less interested in the results, much more interested in our growing alignment and obedience. Last thing, we, we get a picture here of David's understanding of his extension of grace. David is extremely gracious to Saul. And there might be a, a number of different motivations for this. Perhaps it's out of his loyalty to his friend Jonathan. Per, uh, perhaps it's out of respect for Saul, knowing that Saul's been struggling, right? This evil spirit that's been tormenting Saul. Maybe David is just being gentle to him. Perhaps this is, again, another revelation of David's holy imagination, his story-formed heart and mind. He knows God's going to make him king. And he's trusting God's timing rather than making it happen on his own terms. Whatever the motivation, this gets, I think, to the heart of it. David recognizes that taking the kingship through an act of revenge is not as powerful, is not as reflective of God's intentions as receiving the kingship through an act of grace. Taking the kingship uh, as an act of revenge, not as reflective of God's intentions as receiving the kingship as an act of grace, which is David's whole story, right? God chooses David. David doesn't earn the kingship because of, of merit or birthright or winning a contest or anything like this. God chose him. David's whole story is grace. And we see David extend that grace to Saul. May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. David leaves it in God's hands. Now, the story ends, as we read, with Saul weeping and with Saul lamenting the discrepancy in their characters, right? The difference between him and David summarized quite brilliantly and clearly in verse 17. You have treated me well. I have treated you badly. You have treated me well. I have treated you Badly. Saul here expresses some remorse, like there's weeping and tears, but never really apologizes. He sort of confesses, but never offers to change. He asks David to take care of his family, right? Don't wipe my name out, uh, which demonstrates some level of self-interest still very much at the center of, of Saul's actions. David, on the other hand, shows us what true repentance looks like. Actually changing our behavior to align with God's purposes. Saul is a great example of what I would call sentimental spirituality. It looks good. It sounds good. There's a bunch of words, but there's not really any substance to it. We see this all the time in, in, in our culture. There was a situation recently between a congressman and a congresswoman. The congressman made some demeaning remarks about the congresswoman and then did what has become so uh, again, commonplace in our world, I'm sorry that my words offended and hurt you. That's not an apology. That's not 
repentance. But this is what Saul does to David. David's actions speak so much louder than Saul's words. David's actions, his listening to his conscience, his obedience to the prompting, his graciousness towards Saul speaks so much louder than anything Saul has to say. David, in, in keeping with, again, the big story of Scripture, God's heart for his creation, seeks, as the New Testament writer Paul says, to not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful, Paul says, to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These words from Romans chapter 12. Now, as we come in for a landing here, let me be as clear as I possibly can. We live in a deeply, deeply divided time. Politically, within the church, all sorts of lines drawn all over our culture. We live in this deeply divided time. And then on top of that, we're in this pandemic that's left us all frustrated and angry and grieved about many things, tired and worn out. Repaying evil with evil, revenge feels so good. It can feel so good. And here's the the truth. The violence that we do to one another sometimes involves physical violence, unfortunately, but most of the time the violence that we do doesn't come with weapons but with words and and memes and comments. It, It comes in the ways that we ignore certain groups of people. We ignore the plight of the oppressed. It comes in the ways that we seek our own comfort at the expense of the vulnerable. We leave very little room for God's wrath, His judgment, His process to unfold. Eugene Rosenstock Hussey writes, the greatest temptation of our time is impatience. Impatience in its full original meaning, this refusal to wait, to undergo, or to suffer. We seem unwilling to pay the price of living with our fellows in creative and profound relationships. We are unwilling to pay the price of living with our fellow human beings in creative and profound relationships. We leave very little room for God's grace. And yet we need God's grace desperately if we are to live in creative and profound relationships with other human beings. Grace is the currency of the kingdom of right relationships. And so here's my challenge for us, discovery as a church community. It's to allow the story of David, the story of Scripture, these words from Romans 12 to shape our lives and our stories, to keep these words in the front of our minds before you Post that thing on Facebook. Before you write that email, dash off that comment, send that passive-aggressive text, before you cancel that person that you disagree with, ask yourself that question. Have I done everything that I can do to live at peace with this person? Have I pursued peace in this situation? How do I pursue relationship over revenge? David never does live in right relationship with Saul. It's part of the the, the tragedy of the story. Saul doesn't meet him there, and that does happen all too often in our world. But what's more important is that David seeks peace. David seeks the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence, which is the more excellent way to borrow the words of recently passed John Lewis. The way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence, the more excellent way. David waits and he suffers and he pays the price. But we don't break the cycles of madness, 
of violence in our world without God's grace, without taking that grace and allowing it to translate and transform us and the web of relationships that we are a part of. Discovery Christian Church, do not repay evil with evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. And Father, we do make that our prayer this morning. In this world of canceling, division, frustration, the desire for revenge is always right there at the surface, knocking on our door, beckoning to us, so enticing. But the more excellent way, the Jesus way, is this way of peace and love, of seeking right relationship. And God, this doesn't mean that we have to fix everything or, or uh, um, you know, come up with a happy ending to every single situation, God. But on our end of it, may we be people, a community of people who do our best to overcome evil with good. And, and then, God, we leave the rest in your hands. May you be the judge. And, and may you handle the rest of it, God. A big part of this is us learning to trust that you our Savior, you are sovereign, and it's not all on us to put this thing back together. So help us to do our part. Give us the courage to do our part in this, but also then to trust that you will do the rest. To trust that, that you have begun this process of redemption and reconciliation and restoration through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, as we come to the end of this time in our gathering, we express gratitude, deep gratitude for who Jesus is and what you have done through him on our behalf. We pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. As we move to the communion table now at this part of our gathering, I think one of the questions that, that uh, sometimes comes up around our faith is this question of violence. And, and it seems like the God, particularly of the Old Testament, is violent. And then the cross, this uh, thing that is at the center of our faith, is this gruesome moment. And yet, what we see, if we read carefully the story of Scripture, what we see is that it's human beings that, again, try to solve problems through violence. And it is God who graciously steps in to interrupt our patterns of violence. The cross is a massive interruption of the ways that we normally try to handle things on our own. It is God submitting himself, laying his life down, absorbing our violence in his son Jesus. And then overcoming that on the cross, but also through his resurrection from the dead three days later this massive disruption of the way things normally go. This is what grace does. God's grace towards us through Jesus and the grace that we extend to each other as we seek to live at peace with one another. And so Jesus' act, his, his sacrifice on our behalf that we celebrate in this moment called communion, it's an example for us. It, it is uh, the substitution uh, for us, God putting himself in our place. It's also the victory over sin and death that we desperately long for, that that deep ingrained desire for justice and righteousness connects to ultimately. So as we gather to now to take communion in this moment online, wherever you are, get your elements together. This bread representing Jesus' body broken for us and this cup, this juice, this wine, whatever you have, representing his blood poured out for us. Again, God taking on our violence, laying his life down on our behalf as a sacrifice for our sins and as a way for us to engage in right relationship with God. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. When you are ready, take communion with us this morning.
song. Let's just continue to worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live There is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me and your love to those around me.
Thank you again for joining for the gathering today. Um, let's close by reading some of Psalm 26. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with those who are bloodthirsty, and whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. I lead, I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground. In the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. Grace and peace be with you.